quick change to our, uh, a real quick announcement uh, regarding a change to our worship services. Moving forward immediately after the prayer, before the, the final hymn, we're going to be doing a scripture reading each Sunday from uh, whatever text is being preached that Sunday by whatever preacher is preaching. And so today we're starting with Alan. And just by the way, the scriptures are a week in advance in the bulletin, so we're in chapter 1, verses 1 through 14 today, so Brother Alan. Ephesians 1, verses 1 through 14. Chapter 1, verses 1 through 14 of Ephesians. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, to the saints which are at Ephesus, and to the faithful in Christ Jesus, grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us into the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace, wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he hath purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him, in whom also we have obtained an, an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will, that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ in whom ye also trusted after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession and to the praise of his glory. Let's turn it to our elbows to page 98. 98, the name of Jesus.
survived the great blizzard of 24. <laughs> so, it was, uh, you know, I was driving to church and then from church last Sunday you could see the chemicals were on the road so I was uh, good, glad to see that things were being prepared. Yeah, I was kind of getting a little excited you know, we might actually have some snow and it fell and by four o'clock it was gone. You know? yeah. uh, that's okay. I like that part because you know what? You don't have to shovel it. Uh, and you don't have to shovel rain either. So before we start, I do have a, a book here called "Living Abundantly" by Theodore Epp. Um, if you recall the radio broadcast "Back to the Bible," uh, along the lines also of our daily bread, that people would put that out. Uh, this is a commentary on the Book of Ephesians, very readable, very understandable. And so, if you're interested in it. I'll have it down here on the front row for anybody, first come, first serve. And so uh, if you have to fight, then we'll, we'll uh, you know, do some kind of tournament. Uh, you know, <laughs> paper, rock, scissor tournament or something. So, Ephesians chapter 1, if you would. Ephesians chapter 1, we'll be looking at the first 14 verses. Uh, again, the bulletin's a week ahead, so next week you don't need to change the passage. All right there, Terry? Uh, the fictional characters uh, Silas Marner and Ebenezer Scrooge are, are miserly men who begrudged even uh, the slightest gifts and demonstrations of generosity. Uh, those fictional characters found their way into a real life uh, in a miserly woman named Hetty Green. In 1864, at the age of 30, Hetty inherited from her father the then vast fortune of seven and a half million dollars. Uh, which she invested very shrewdly. Uh, she was credited to have earned $1.25 million in one year alone, an astonishing figure in its day. When she married, she demanded that her then-to-be husband sign a prenuptial agreement stating that he renounced any and all claims to her wealth. Uh, she refused to budge on this agreement when her husband's business went bankrupt, and not long after losing his money, he left her. <laughs> She was equally as miserly toward her children. Uh, for example, when her son broke his leg, she took him to the local free clinic, where she was promptly declined because of her financial status. Uh, infuriated, she vowed to treat her son's injury herself. Uh, long story short, the leg developed gangrene and was amputated simply because she refused to pay the doctor for an easily treatable injury. Uh, once her children finally became of age and left the house, she moved continually from apartment to apartment, staying only long enough not to have to pay New York City's property taxes. At the same time, she loaned money to the city to keep it operating. Uh, as one of the wealthiest people in the world, she refused to heat her house, or her housing rather, during the winter. She wouldn't even make hot water for her oatmeal. I mean, Ebony's or Scrooge even begrudgingly used coal, right? She wore the same clothing until it became unusable with wear. Rather than paying for an office, the Witch of Wall Street, as she was nicknamed, sat in the lobby of the Seaboard National Bank where she sent her briefcases and did her business. She was so tight with her finances that on occasion she was known to travel thousands of miles just to collect relatively minor debts. Although she was a miser, she did hire a maid, but the maid was literally her end. In 1916, Hetty died of a fit, arguing with her maid that she should have purchased skim milk instead of whole milk because it was cheaper. Uh, 
Had he left an estate of somewhere between 100 and 200 million dollars, roughly between two and four billion dollars in today's economy. And such is the ironic tale of Hetty Green. A woman with immense wealth refused to use it even for the basic comforts of life. And the sad reality that, is that there are some Christians who have been, are in the same position here as Hetty. They, they've been blessed with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ. And yet so many believers rely so little upon those blessings. The believer can have all the grace that he or she needs to meet life's trials, but the believer lives as a spiritual pauper, following their own ways and their own thoughts and their own counsel. And Paul understood the immense wealth that he had in Christ, which stood in stark contrast to his situation. What was his situation? Well, Paul wrote uh, four letters from prison. We call them the prison epistles, and Ephesians is one of those letters. Uh, prisons in those days were hardly the humane institutions they are today in our country. One place where we know Paul was in prison was literally a hole in the basement of the prison, a hole in which all of the filth and the mire of the prison collected. It was a cold, damp, disgustingly filthy, vermin-infested, miserable place. One would hardly imagine that, that Paul was one of the wealthiest people on the face of the earth to see him sitting in this kind of suffering. And in spite of the misery of confinement, we don't catch the slightest whiff of stench of the prison for which he writes. As a matter of fact, Paul writes with such enthusiasm and conviction that we would think he was a famous and successful television preacher and author to them. You must arrive at one of two conclusions. Either Paul really believed what he said, or he was nothing but a fraud. Since Paul wrote under divine authority, I, I believe Paul's beliefs were true. Amen. You might be in a difficult place in your life right now. If you aren't, and most certainly will be before too long, or maybe you're coming out of a rough situation. If you're like me, uh, you want one way or the other to have resolution to your problem uh, the, the day before yesterday, right? Uh, we whine and complain about our problems and and we stress ourselves because things don't seem to go our way. We throw hissy fits and temper tantrums, and we make expedient decisions rather than ones that glorify God. And, and we do these things because we can't see the end of our situation. We can't see how God is going to resolve our situation. We know God can work. We doubt whether he will work simply because we cannot imagine how he will work. If we would lift our eyes from the stresses of life to look at what we possess in Christ, we're, we're too often distracted with our own problems to see that God's glory is displayed in and around us. God's glory places us in a unique position in Christ. And that unique position holds powerful application today. And so the sermon here in seven words is this, I will live to praise God's glory. I will live to praise God's glory. Let's see how this truth works. We're looking at the first few verses here, starting in verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, to the saints which are at Ephesus, and to the faithful in Christ Jesus, grace be to you, and peace from God our Father, and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has, hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as he has chosen us in him, in Christ, before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Having predestinated us according to the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of his grace, the glory of his grace, wherein he has made us accepted in the beloved. Right off the bat, we see something important here. Paul calls the members of the church at, at Ephesus saints. Now, when we think of saints, we sometimes think of believers in the Old Testament. Uh, we might even think of believers who have already departed from this life, uh, people we recognize for extraordinary spiritual accomplishments. And, but these are not what Paul means by saints. Paul wrote to ordinary people in ordinary lives doing ordinary things, navigating in a culture, life in, in a culture where anything goes, while living a godly life themselves. 
They were people just like you and me. They had families and jobs and life issues just like we do today. There was nothing in and of themselves that was special, at least as far as conventional understanding of sainthood is concerned. And in spite of their ordinariness, Paul addresses them as saints. Sainthood has nothing to do with how we view ourselves. Sainthood has everything to do with how God views us. No one confers sainthood upon us. And just as Paul was an apostle by God's will, every believer is a saint by God's will. How can we say this? Well, first of all, you and I have been blessed with every spiritual blessing. Now, let's look quickly at these blessings. I'll move quickly, but if you have chapter 1, uh, they're open to you. What we see in verse 1, we're saints. In, in verse 2, we're chosen and holy. In verse 5, we're adopted. In verses 7 and 8, we're lavished with God's grace. Verse 9, we are audience to God's plans. Verse 11, we're inheritors. Verse 13, we're sealed and secure in our salvation by the Holy Spirit. Now, all of these are incredible blessings. But you know what? They're still only the, the byproduct of the main blessing. What is God's blessing? Jesus Christ is God's greatest blessing to us. Amen. There is nothing better for God to give. If there was something better, then God gave us less than his best when he sent Jesus Christ to this earth. God's gift of Jesus means that the blessings we enjoy in this life in the heavenly places have nothing to do with our circumstances. How do we know this? Well, note Paul's use of the word heavenly places there. And at first, this seems to be the, the blessing of eternity in heaven. We could certainly understand it that way, and that's true. But, but that being said, our, our blessings must be more than some vague, distant future, as good as that future will be. Christ must have some bearing upon our lives today. What does it mean that we're blessed in heavenly places? Well, our, our blessings find their source in heaven. This means that our problems have no influence upon God's blessings upon us now or ever. Nothing we experience in this life will affect the blessings that we have in Jesus Christ. As, as a matter of fact, the blessings we have ought to affect this life or else we believe in an unproven theory. Everything we're talking about is just hypothetical here today. Jesus must be able to affect change in this life. Or he is not as good as he claims to be. This takes us to verses 4 and 5. Jesus' goodness for our lives was determined long before our problems came into our lives. Since Jesus is our greatest blessing, another truth arises. We as believers are chosen by God. This is the doctrine of election. Uh, we, we need not hesitate to use that word. It's a truth clearly taught in the scripture. Godly people disagree on exactly what this means. Some believe that it applies before salvation. We here at Verina believe that God chose in eternity past to make all who believe in Christ to be holy and blameless. In other words, everything that Christ is, the believer has already become in God's sight. At the moment of salvation, Christ's goodness and holiness becomes ours. Election also means adoption. Uh, all who believe uh, become God's children. This is not, not everyone holds this unique position. So, some believe that everyone is God's child. It's not the case. Every person to have lived and ever will live does not elect in God's sight. Only those who are holy hold the unique title of God's children. And verse 6 tells us our response to this unique place that we as believers have in our unique Christ. The grace of God which adopted us, which offered his salvation and forgiveness to us, which, which made us unique in Christ is a wonderful truth. The truth that we are elected, that we are good at God's sake, is something that ought to stir in us to praise God's grace and glory. We as believers exist for the sole purpose to praise God's glorious grace. Did you catch that? I'll say it again. We as believers exist for the sole purpose to praise God's glorious grace. What's glory? One author best defines the term. He says, the glory of anything is the excellence that makes it first 
and therefore unique. The glory of God is that unique excellence that makes him supreme. God's glory is his, his uniqueness, his supremacy, his excellence, and this infinite, the infinite extent of God's goodness as well as any other characteristic he possesses is his glory. And Paul points our attention to the glory of God's grace. God's grace, his unmerited, undeserved favor is worthy of our praise. The fact that God saw you and me in our sin and guilt and shame and yet loved us is an astonishing thought. And we echo with the hymn writer, amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found but blind. But now I see all of this glory came in the only and unique way that it could come through Jesus Christ, the beloved. Every believer is loved with the same kind of love that God the Father has for his son. And that's an amazing truth too. God's love for you will not change for any reason unless his love for the son changes. God cannot love you uh, as a believer more or less than he already does. Remember verse three, blessed be God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. We have already received every spiritual blessing. God doesn't love us by degrees. You know, as long as we do good, he loves us. But if we stop doing good, well, he just doesn't love us so much. Not anymore. God doesn't withhold part of his love until we prove we're worthy. He doesn't place conditions on his love for the believer. He loves you far more than you ever dared to imagine. God loves us with an everlasting love. What a wonderful truth. And if that's not reason to praise the glory of God's grace, I don't know what is. We've seen here election and adoption, and these were all decrees. We couldn't make them happen. God had to declare that he would do it and then do it. These were decisions which the Father determined to accomplish through us and in Christ. Let's see how God was able to do these incredible things in verses 7 and following in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace, wherein he has abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure which he has purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who works after all things according to the counsel of his own will, that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ. Note again the words, the words in verse 10, depending on what translation you use, to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ, uh, to unite all things in him, gather together all things in Christ, the summing up of all things in Christ, we find in several translations here. If you looked in the Bible concordance, you discovered that the central idea in that phrase refers to a mathematical equation. When you add numbers, you take several numbers to make one new number. It's the total, or in mathematical terms, the sum. The sum is the bottom line. It's the goal. It's the climax. It's final. And all of the blessings in heavenly places come through Christ alone. There's no one better who could possibly give these blessings. Verse 7 tells us the way that Christ gives those blessings through his blood. There was no other, better or, no other or better way to give those blessings. The death and resurrection of Jesus was the goal and climax, the sum, the final result of God's purposes for us. And this leads us to ask an important question. What is the blood of Christ and what does it do? If you've ever seen the, the movie uh, Ben-Hur, at the very end, you see these two women who are physically healed when Jesus' blood dripped down from the cross. Uh, Christ's blood holds no kind of superstitious power like that. We, mu we must understand that the literal blood is a, a metonym for the re redemptive death of Jesus. Now, a metonym is, is one word substituted for another, a small part representing the whole. For example, we call our car wheels, you know? Uh, we call the government Washington. 
Uh, through and, and through these small things, we see the whole. And through the, the, the though the blood represents redemption, the death of Christ should only occur by the shedding of blood. Hebrews 9, 22, without the shedding of blood, there's no remission, no forgiveness. If you looked in the Bible concordance, you discover that word remission is, is the same word that translated forgiveness here in our text this morning. What's the forgiveness of redemption mean? The Bible concordance will also tell you that the root word translated forgiveness literally means to send away. And what a new light this sheds on Psalm 103. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. I think I used this illustration not long ago, but if you start walking north, at some point you'll reach the North Pole and you'll have to start walking south. But if you start walking west, you will never start walking east, and vice versa. You will never, west and east will never meet. Our sin and our guilt were sent completely away from us when we believed in the death of Christ. Our sin and our guilt was sent so far away that we could never find it, even if we wanted to try. You know, all of these spiritual blessings of complete forgiveness have been given to the believer, yet, yet so many believers live under a cloud of misunderstanding about this doctrine. They, they sense guilt and shame over past sins or even present shortcomings, and, and they make wrong choices and, and decisions through which they essentially try to cover or to remove their shame, and they, they blame others. They make excuses. And consequently, they cause themselves more unnecessary problems. They truly believe in the forgiveness of Christ's redemption. They get self save themselves so much self-imposed grief and despair to live in the brilliant sunlight of God's grace and love. How great is our redemption? When God's grace sent Jesus to shed his blood and to die to grant forgiveness to us. That grace is lavished on us. And you've heard me use this illustration before. I like chocolate cake. <laughs> And my mother-in-law was just, and over that, I think she's probably the chief cook in heaven. Uh, just incredible. And she would make this cake for me called Death by Chocolate. And, and there are days that, you know, I, I think, you know, if I'm going to die, I'd like you go eating her cake. You know? <laughs> what made the cake so good was that like, the cake was delicious, don't get me wrong, but that she would make this icing. And, and it... I could, I, I could almost eat that icing if it weren't, if I knew it wasn't unhealthy to do so, you know? And she would lavish that icing on the cake. I mean, she would lay it on thick. That's the idea of lavish. On an infinite scale, God lavishes the glory of his grace on us in such a way that he will need all of eternity to display it. And in this way, the grace of God is a mystery. When we think of a mystery today, we think of whodunit stories like, like Sherlock Holmes, you know, the Hardy Boys, uh, maybe Agatha Christie or James Patterson, John Grisham, some more modern authors. We, we think of intrigue and crime, and, and we, we think of the unending quest for artifacts on Oak Island. They're never going to find gold, I think, you know? And our concept of mystery centers on the gathering of facts and the discovering of truth. We work from the unknown to the known. The New Testament concept of mystery is like when we stand at the end of our search for truth. The truth is now known, but it was previously unknown. We as believers today look back at the Old Testament scenes, and we kind of scratch our heads sometimes. We wonder why they didn't get it, you know? I mean, could God, God was right there in front of you, Abraham, David, Moses, right? Old Testament believers were like our, our current idea of a mystery. They had the facts, but they couldn't quite connect all the dots. They didn't completely understand what they knew. We look back and we see how everything unfolded, and it makes sense to us because we have all of, 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 our, of it, all of the facts. God revealed his plan to display his glorious grace to us in Christ. The entire goal of God's plan of redemption is to bring human history to a specific time when everything will in willing, absolute, and final submission to Christ. 
Your Bible may use the word dispensation or administration. The word picture is that of an orchestra. You've attended a, a symphony orchestra performance. You, you, you watched as the conductor took his place and he raised his baton. And on the downbeat, 50 musicians all started in perfect unison. And just as a conductor leads each in instrument in a symphony, so also God, in complete wisdom and insight, guides millions of threads of human affairs so that Christ will be exalted over everything. But you know what? Sometimes life is confusing. If we're a musical score, it would sound more like the orchestra tuning itself up before the performance rather than the perfect harmony of the concert. And sometimes life's soundtrack sounds like the music at the climax of one of Alfred Hitchcock's movies. You know, it's discordant, harsh, out of tune. We repeat the cliche, God works in mysterious ways in an attempt to comfort ourselves somehow, but our shallow theology doesn't really match reality. Our theology sounds good on Sunday morning, but not on Monday morning. And while we may not know exactly how God's work uh, works, he, he does give us all of the wisdom and insight we need to understand his plan. The P, Apostle Peter writes, according as his divine power has given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness, through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and virtue, whereby these promises were given unto us, exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the Everything we need to know about life and living it for God is already revealed in the Word of God. Mystery also means something else. God's uniqueness is so great that when He plans and decrees and acts, His works are far beyond what we could ever imagine, let alone to understand. Isaiah 55 My thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are my ways your ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. But for Christ in the scriptures, we would have no clue that God's works include us. This means that God's glorious grace reveals to us our place in his plans. I personally believe that God's plan has many facets, an infinite number of facets, because God is infinite. Nearly all of which we do not nor cannot know, let alone understand. I think we show arrogance when we say or think that we want God to show us what he's doing as if we would understand all these threads of influence that come and go from that situation. Would we really understand how yesterday impacts today and how tomorrow today impacts tomorrow? I also believe we're arrogant if we assume that the plan of redemption is the only plan that God orchestrates. Nevertheless, the plan of redemption is the only one that we need to know to live for him and to love him rightly. Do you realize what this means? Your lot in life at this very moment is part of God's eternal plan and is accomplishing exactly what God intends to accomplish. And I, I don't know about you, but I find this truth to be simultaneously confusing and exciting. How is it confusing? I'm in the middle of a situation that I've been trying to do right for a long time. I have no doubt that I've done right, but no matter how often I do what's right, it just doesn't seem to work. Have you ever been there? As a matter of fact, it seems like I'm the guy who gets the short end of the stick. Of course, I got a martyr's complex too, you know. Let me put it another way, and maybe a way that you thought it, it just doesn't seem right, or it doesn't seem like it pays to do right. You ever, you ever been in a situation like that? I'm learning that the ultimate blessing in heavenly places, places is the same blessing I enjoy today, even though I don't always recognize it. The blessing is Christ's goodness. And Christ's goodness has already given me everything I need, all the resources I need to keep doing what is right. That's grace. That's the exciting part of the truth. I, I have a place in Christ's goodness. I, I, I find it to be a wonderful privilege to be found in Christ, not having my own righteousness, but his. 
Paul says in verse 12 that he praised the Lord that he and those with him were that he were writing were among the first to be found in Christ, among the first to be part of God's mystery, which is the church. God understands where human beings. He knows we can see and understand only just the smallest part of his plan. He knows that our faith is stretched in times of difficulty. And, and so he gave us another blessing found in the last two verses of our text. Verse 13. In whom also ye trusted. After that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. In whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. Let's bring all of this that I've said here today to a rubber meets the road application. Every believer is sealed by the Holy Spirit. Now what does that mean? A while back, I, I bought something on Amazon, but I wanted to make sure this wasn't just a, a cheap knockoff from a foreign country. I didn't want a, the thing catching fire while I was trying to use it, you know? And, and so the, the product, I, had, I looked for a specific thing on the product. Uh, you've probably seen it, maybe not paid a whole lot of attention to it, but the seal has the letters UL in a circle. Uh, it, it, Underwriters Laboratories is what that stands for. And this means that a company, this laboratory, put the product to the test and found that it would work under ordinary circumstances. And their logo was a, a seal of approval, a promise that the merchandise was authentic, it will do exactly what it's advertised to do. So it's got that seal. Uh, here's another illustration. In, in 2007, uh, baseball player Barry Bonds broke Babe Ruth's home run, uh, career home run record. He hit more home runs than any other baseball player in history. And the ball went into the stands and it was immediately retrieved by baseball officials. They documented the ball was indeed authentic. Why? Well, they didn't want unscrupulous people trying to sell a thousand balls that were in the lab of the ball that broke the record, right? The documents that they created for that ball were the sign of authenticity. We call it providence. The Holy Spirit proves that Christ's goodness is real. God, Christ's goodness is not a figment of our imagination that we use as a crutch to carry us through the day. The seal also means security. Uh, have you ever purchased a jar of food at the store? When you open the jar, you hear a pop, and, and from that moment, the center of the lid pops up and down, and, and when you press on it, that flexibility indicates that the seal has been broken. If you purchase food where the seal has been broken, the security of the food has com been compromised. You don't want to eat it because you can't be sure that someone hasn't messed with it. The Holy Spirit seals us into Christ. We've already been placed into Christ at the moment of salvation, but the Holy Spirit proves that we're kept securely in Christ. Sealing also identifies or indicates identification or ownership. But if you have a checking account, you have a seal. Your name and account number is pre-printed on every check. The check proves that it's your account and your money. The Holy Spirit is proof that Christ's goodness has been put to our spiritual account. The sealing of the sphere also provides authority. So a detective uh, questioning a person at or near a crime scene flashes a badge. Here, Dano 5-0, you know. The badge indicates that the detective possesses the authority to investigate. Now, why do we as believers need authority? We, we need authority to proclaim the message of truth, the gospel of salvation. For, for example, I can't speak for the President of the United States. I, I don't have the necessary authority to do so. This is why I can't call the local news station and tell them that the president said such and such. I, I possess no authority. Likewise, apart from Christ, we possess no authority to give the message of the gospel. Christ gave us this authority in Matthew 28, the Great Commission. Jesus said, all power is given to me in heaven and earth. That power, that's the authority. That's the seal. Go and baptize, he said. You as a believer have Christ's authority to give the gospel, to speak on his behalf. That's your first application. You live for the praise of God's glorious grace as you give the gospel. That's exactly what evangelism is. When you tell someone that Jesus is their savior, you're praising Jesus. 
Uh, let me illustrate it this way. A, a, a while back, my family and I went to, to visit family in Williamsburg. This is before we moved. And um, a friend who from Pennsylvania who, who spent time in Williamsburg regularly suggested that we go to a particular restaurant. And, and they went on and on about how good the food was. Uh, and the, the more they talked, the hungrier I got, you know? And we, we went to the restaurant on the recommendation because they praised it. And it was ever good as they said it was. When you witness, you praise Jesus. You give the other person a reason to consider why Jesus should be their personal Lord and Savior. You tell them that you once lived a life that desired only praise for yourself. He created, he created problems with the people around you because, you know what? My brand of selfishness conflicts with your brand of selfishness and vice versa. So, so we have problems with each other, you know? I want praise. I want me. Me, 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 me. And you say the same thing. Me, 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 me. I want praise for myself. It create problems in our jobs and hobbies and every area of life. Some of those problems may have been life-dominating issues, like uh, you know, a host of, of things that could be things that just control us. And you learn that Jesus died in your place to rescue you from God's wrath on those sins. And when you believed on Jesus' death and resurrection was the only way to get out from under the weight of God's wrath and the soul, uh, the guilt and shame, that you have every spiritual blessing in Christ. At the moment of belief, you receive the Holy Spirit as the promise that you will enjoy all of those blessings for eternity. They will never, for any reason, be revoked. That's amazing. Because we know how we are when, when people do things to us. You know, we, we get offended. We're hurt. We don't want anything to do with them. We're offended. We offended God more than he, we ever offended us. Uh, we offended others when they offended us. And, and yet, God gave us his son, the person he loves the most, to shed his blood on our behalf. That's amazing. That's the gospel. Mm. If that's not reason to praise God, I don't know what it is. Mm. <laughs> And that's the gospel invitation. And if you've never believed on Jesus, you can do so right now if you're watching online in the audience. Simply confess that you're, you're not one of God's children and ask him to forgive you, and he will. If you have other questions, feel free to talk to me or someone else in this room. We can show you from the Bible what God, Jesus did on the cross for you. Witnessing is the first way that you praise God's glorious grace. The next way that you praise God's glorious grace is to live according to God's plan. As a believer, you hold a vital part in God's plan. You are a monument to God's grace. We'll, we'll see later in Ephesians that you're a masterpiece, a trophy of God's grace. You ought to live that way. Britain's, uh, Britain's uh, Princess Victoria learned that, as a young girl that she was to be the queen. She learned this from her personal tutor. To that point, she'd known that her family was important, but she never realized her unique position. And the tutor explained to her that she was next in line to lead the country. And this sudden realization overwhelmed the little girl, and she broke into tears. And her tutor embraced her until the tears passed, and Victoria looked into her teacher's face, and she said, if I shall be queen then I shall be good. A little girl realized the enormity of her position and responsibility. She knew that great blessings came with great requirements. You, as a believer, have received great blessings, every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ, and your life ought to reflect God's grace to everyone you meet. You live your faith before a sinful and depraved world that's watching to see if Jesus really does make a difference in a person's life. They, they want to see if your faith is just something good for Sunday morning, but not for Monday morning. They want to see if theology is more than a theory. If it really works in practical ways. They want to see if Christianity is more than just a few tired cliches. 
And you make Christ unique when you say with your mouth, with your actions, with the decisions you make, with your life, that Christ is glorious. You tell everyone that God's glory is what is what it's at stake. One commentator writes, all God's assets are on the line. If everything God gave you in Christ is not enough, then there's nothing on earth that is or ever will be enough. If everything Christ has given to you is insufficient for your problems, then Christ is a fraud. We can easily give the impression that Christ is not enough. How do we do this? We throw our hands in the air and we say, I give up. We walk away from a brother or sister in Christ with whom we disagree and we abandon them as if they're disposable. We make decisions that are easy to make simply because they're easy to make. We excuse our sin or the sin of others, and we might say something like, well, that's just the way I am. That's just the way so-and-so is. And 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 in in those excuses, we empower, we enable, we encourage others to do sin, even though we may not have intended to do so. We seek to bring honor and respect to ourselves rather than seeking to give honor and respect to Christ. And these are just a few examples. What should we do? We must give Christ the praise and the glory. When we disagree with another person, we must believe that what Christ said about resolving differences and how forgiveness works because he and his ways are always better than ours. When we would give up, we must praise Christ because he did not give up when life became difficult. Can you imagine after being on the cross for about an hour, oh, you know what, I give up. This is too hard. I'm getting down. And where would we be today? But we would make the decision to follow our will and pleasure. We must praise Christ because he said, not my will, but thine be done. Every situation in your life is yet one more evidence of Christ's ultimate goodness. And so the question is this. Am I looking for Christ's goodness in every situation in life? What does all this mean for our church? What was said about the individual believer in this text is also true of this church, that the individual believers in this church were chosen by God to be part of the universal church, as we talked about last week, which our local church is an evidence of the universal church. How can our church praise and glorify Christ in light of our text? Well, what are you doing to contribute to Brian the Baptist's praise and glorification of Christ? Let me encourage you to do some homework this coming week. A piece of paper. Write down five things that you're doing to serve your brothers and sisters in Christ in this church. And write down three things that you can do but are not doing. And complete this assignment and, and, and see what the Holy Spirit reveals to you about, about what you can do for Christ and for his bride, the church. What you do for Christ in this church will help Brian of Baptist be what Christ has in, in eternity past elected, chosen it to be. We draw to a close, and I had to laugh at a television commercial I saw a long time ago. A woman was on a stationary bike, and she was pedaling very slowly, just completely absorbed on her cell phone. And her sister was trying to talk to her, and she replied, you're ruining my workout. Cycling is my passion. And if she were riding an actual bike, she would barely be pedaling fast enough to stay upright, you know? But that was her passion. Is that the way we praise God? We sing, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice on Sunday morning. And on Monday morning, we say, well, I went to church yesterday. I'll do whatever we want to do. Is that a life that praises God? God chose that all who believe on Jesus would live a life of praise. God designed the life of faith to shout for the entire universe that Christ is uniquely good. That's the purpose for which Christ predestined you. That's what the church should show to its community. And furthermore, God's grace doesn't give us just enough forgiveness to get to heaven. God doesn't just give us just enough grace that we can barely cope with our problems. God's grace is more than sufficient to help us to live a life of love and praise no matter how difficult our circumstances might be. So are we going to be like Hetty Green, treating heaven's wealth like a miser? Or will we use that wealth to live a healthy faith that attracts the attention of the people around us? Are we living to the praise of God's glory?
May the good Lord give us the grace to hear and do his word. Let's pray. Amen. I invite you in the silence in the next few moments to consider your praise of Christ. Is Christ the reason why you do everything you do? Allow the Holy Spirit to continue to speak your hearts. Gracious Heavenly Father, we praise you for the intricate and detailed plan which you predestined in eternity past. We thank you for your infinite wisdom and power which sought us where we were and extended to us the ultimate blessing which is Christ. We ask that you would cause the non-believer here today or maybe watching online to see his or her need to glorify your son. Save that person today. We ask that you would forgive us as believers who are here today who have not lived consistently with your election. We ask that you would help each believer here today to realize that he or she can do what you've called him or her to do. Even we may not consider ourselves adequate to the task. We pray these things in the exalted name of Jesus. Amen. That is all stand. Page 66. Years I spent the penalty in pride, carrying God, his people was crucified. Knowing night it was for me, he died on the mountain. comes from Ephesians 3, now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to his power that worketh in us, unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. Amen. God bless you.